Andrew, I found your poster uh, intriguing. It's a topic that is famous and infamous, and it sounds like uh, with some important pearls for dermatologists. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell us a little about it. Sure. The use of Agent Orange and uh, some of the other defoliants in the Vietnam War was uh, very controversial at the time, uh, and some of that scrutiny has remained over the years, uh, just as questions have emerged uh, relating to how some of those exposures uh, would uh, affect the health of the military personnel um, and the civilians who are exposed. The Institute of Medicine released a fairly extensive biannual review of all the medical data out there that covers organic chlorine exposures, uh, which Agent Orange falls under, um, but it doesn't have a specific section addressing skin diseases. Um, so we really felt that was a, a practice gap that we could help fill. Um, so we sought to create a, a useful guide for both military dermatologists and non-military dermatologists uh, for when they're approached in clinic by a patient saying, hey, could this condition that I have be the result of Agent Orange, or hey, I'm a veteran, um, could this be related to that? Or as a, a condition that the dermatologist would then have to associate with sure, that absolutely, history absolutely. that you might not know. Uh, so we performed a, a systematic review of the literature um, and we selected any organochlorine uh, exposures uh, studies that had involved humans. Uh, we ended up uh, including 112 reviews in the, the paper, uh, which was, was a pretty sizable amount. And what we found was certainly the most notorious use of uh, organic chlorines was with Agent Orange as a defoliant uh, in the Vietnam War under the U.S. campaign of Operation Ranch Hand. But there had actually been a lot more organic chlorine exposures through some large-scale industrial uh, accidents and um, occupational exposures. And there have even been some high-profile poisoning uh, cases with the axon. Um, most notably, uh, there was a, a Ukrainian politician Victor Yushchenko. He was actually poisoned with the axon, and he's been able to serve as kind of a great case study of, you know, chloractin, some of the common uh, medical conditions associated with uh, organic chlorine exposures. Did you come so. across Times Beach? We did. Yeah. There's a number of, uh, of chemical accidents. A lot of those industrial accidents are, are certainly, you know, unfortunate, but they've been able to track some of those populations as a, a longitudinal study um, in more of a controlled setting, uh, as opposed to some of the, the, the troop records from Vietnam, where it's tough to know who was exposed to how much Agent Orange. Mm. Um, and some of the, the data coming from Vietnam has shown that the, the real kind of toxic exposures actually occurred in the, the Army Chemical Corps and the Operation Ranch Hand members distributing and spraying the Agent Orange, um, as opposed to the ground troop exposure, which was, was really minimal based on the data. And so uh, your conclusions are the, the dermatologic conditions that fell out of the analysis? Sure. Um, so we, we did find a couple skin diseases that are associated with uh, organic chlorine exposures. Um, most prominently is, is chloracne, uh, which is a, a, an uncommon uh, non-inflammatory acneiform disorder. Um, it, it's really classified or characterized by open and closed comedones um, and some straw-colored cysts that occur in a, a characteristic malar and periauricular distribution. Um, typically, the lesions will uh, develop approximately two to four weeks after exposure, um, and they, they really regress uh, over the course of six months to three years uh, if it has been a one-time exposure. Uh, so it, there, that's probably the most sensitive biomarker for uh, organic chlorine exposure, um, but it is in the acute uh, post-exposure setting. Is there any long-term follow-up of people with chloracne and the subsequent There's not a lot of great pumps? data out there. Um, many of the kind of follow-up um, Agent Orange Vietnam War studies did a great job of tracking patients over time, sometimes as, uh, as long as 30 years after the fact, um, but they were a little bit slow to get going. So sometimes there would be a 10-year gap even after the initial exposure to start studying, which makes things really tricky um, because almost all of the chloracne symptoms would be gone by that. So it's made it hard to track, but in cases such as the Cerveso Italy accident, when we know right that day, it's much easier to track some of those uh, conditions over time. Of people who suffered chloracne, and, and likely from Agent Orange exposure, sure. is that patient population uh, more at risk for some of the other long-term complications that, that um, you found? Not specifically that oh, we found. Don't have that data. Um, so it, just in the single case study of Victor Yushchenko, the chloracne lesions have certainly, you know, resolved. Um, but there's not a lot of clear associations of, hey, people that got chloracne had that a, a larger dose-dependent exposure, um, and they would be more likely to develop some of the other conditions um, that we found associations with, uh, which include uh, PCT or periphery cutanea tarda, um, some cutaneous lymphomas, including non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, and some select soft tissue sarcomas, uh, particularly uh, DFSP. Um, and leomyosarcoma. Um, some of the more common conditions that 
have very inconclusive evidence where um, non-melanoma skin cancers, melanoma, eczema, uh, and milia, uh, as well as some other non-specific uh, dermatologic conditions, um, and then some conditions that there was really an unlikely association or there's very little data, uh, include psoriasis, um, subderm, um, and hypertrichosis. How did you uh, separate the, all those common things as being maybe a little bit of a risk factor? Um, so it, it's very challenging uh, because a lot of the studies, while they're, they're very large in scope and longitudinal kind of um, length that they followed, um, a lot of them rely on self-reporting um, or maybe a, a skin exam that was performed by a non-licensed dermatologist, so maybe a general practitioner um, or someone who's m less familiar with some of those conditions. Um, so it's challenging in terms of the data uh, analysis, um, but because there are so many studies, um, some of the inconclusive uh, conditions would maybe have one or two studies that did show an association, whereas another study or two uh, would show that there was no uh, association there. Nice. The waters are, are muddy there. Um, <laughs> But it, it is a, an opportunity in research. And moving forward, um, we've talked about uh, potentially using some of the military-centered databases um, and trying to go back uh, and perform a, a case control study with the, you know, the aid of a, a board-certified dermatologist to really look at some of the skin conditions as opposed to more of the systemic things that are reviewed uh, in the Institute of Medicine uh, reports. So what do you think the impact on your findings has on uh, veterans with regards to service-related Sure, uh, sure. I, I think the impact is, is pretty large. Um, I think the first thing is that uh, not a lot of people know about the skin conditions associated with Agent Orange. Um, so I, I think it's important to educate your patients in light of the associations that we found. Um, if you do have a patient um, that's age appropriate and presents with a diagnosis of uh, PCT, cutaneous lymphomas, um, or a soft tissue sarcoma, um, you should certainly screen them for some industrial um, exposures or risk factors that they could have currently, uh, as well as screen for prior military service. Um, the Veterans Department, U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs has taken a stance of presumptive uh, exposure. So any uh, veteran that served in the Vietnam War uh, from 1962 to 1971 in Vietnam or Southeast Asia, they actually presume that they were exposed to Agent Orange regardless of what their job was. Um, and then they assessed for service-related injuries based on 14 conditions that they have established have associations. Um, and then they assess for disability from there. Um, so what we really recommend is if you do have a veteran that may fit that bill, um, to contact your local uh, Veterans Affairs Environmental Health Coordinator and really refer them through there uh, so they can register with the Agent Orange Registry uh, and as well as get the ball rolling on the disability assessment. Um, if you do run across a patient with a new diagnosis of chloracne or concerns that maybe their uh, chloracne is stemming, persistent chloracne is stemming from Agent Orange uh, back in the Vietnam War, uh, we would really encourage you to look for current dioxin exposures uh, as the time course of chloracne really doesn't fit with that. Uh, so it's important to be especially cognizant of you know, some other risk factors. And then if you are approached with uh, one of the conditions that doesn't have a clear organochlorine association, uh, just to provide reassurance uh, to the patient that there is no documented exposure, uh, redirect them to the the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs uh, website has some great resources and information. Um, and then assess for any multidisciplinary health needs that might be underlying in that patient, uh, particularly with uh, respect to psychosocial needs uh, in the high-risk veterans population. Um, so certainly for further information, I would recommend that people go to www.publichealth.va.gov. Um, there's a lot of great information there, some Agent Orange newsletters, information about ongoing studies. Um, you can find out who your actual local environmental health coordinator is and their contact information at the VA. Um, and then there's resources there about Agent Orange for both patients and providers. Um, and then if you, certainly if you're interested in some of the non-dermatologic findings, I would encourage you to go to the uh, Institute of Medicine's exhaustive report uh, covering the data about organic chlorine exposures. Um, the most recent one is the 2012 version, and the 2014 version is anticipated to come out early 2016. So I would keep your eyes open for that one. That has a lot of great data as well. Our health dollars at work. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. That was really comprehensive summary. Thank you.